Hey everyone, so I've got this painting here that's all done on layers. I'll turn all these layers off, and as I click through them one by one, you'll see that each layer is its own isolated pass of light, shadow, color, and detail. No layer by itself is the complete rendering, but start stacking them together, and voila, we have a finished painting. Now I want to walk you through this process. I'll be using Clip Studio Paint today. It's a fantastic app that I recommend, but don't worry, you can follow this tutorial in any app you like. First, let's import some brushes. Make sure the brush tool is active here, then grab my ABR file that I've included and drag it onto this bar. That'll create a subtool containing two of my favorite brushes. Gonna go up to File Open and bring in my line drawing. This is also available in the pinned comment, by the way. And in our Layers window here, I'll double click to name the layer. Then I'll pull up the Layer Mode menu and set it to Multiply. See, in the default normal layer mode, sometimes a line drawing can have different shades of gray, which can be undesirable when you're trying to paint underneath. Switching that layer mode to multiply will ensure that only the rich darks show through. I'll make a new layer to paint on with this button here. I'll drag that below the line drawing and double click to rename it BG for background. This layer just stays on normal mode. I'm grabbing the paint bucket tool with a light neutral gray color and just fill in that background. Then I'll grab the brush tool with one of the hard soft brushes to block in something abstract here. All right, I'll make a new layer, rename it Shadow. We want shadows to darken things, of course, so I'll set it to Multiply. Now on this shadow layer, I'm only thinking about black and white tones, so I can ignore all the colors on my color picker and just be concerned with the grays here. So there's two overall base tones at play. The hair overall is darker and the flesh overall is lighter. That's pretty easy to paint, so I'll get that working first. I'm now moving into the shadows that are on her face, but I want to show you what I'm thinking about here, so it's time for a quick side lesson. In this 3D program, I have a ball lit by a fairly soft light. The light will create a division between light, of course, and then all of this is shadow. Now, that's pretty intuitive. What's a little less intuitive is how the values are divided amongst those two families. Here are some values in the light, and here are some values in the shadow. Think of these as families that kind of want to stick to themselves. So I recommend maintaining a bit of a gap here. You know, don't put any values there. This helps clarify in your painting which family lives where. Also, because our eyes detect the most information in light, it's common practice to give the light family a little more real estate as compared to the shadow family. Now, as for individual grayscale values, this middle light value here is important. I think of it as an average light value, which you can apply to your entire light side to start with. Lighter than that will be your highlight value. Then there's this part. It's in the light, but it's where the form is starting to turn away from the light. This is called halftone, and it's the darkest part of your light family. Now, when I fade back here, notice how even though the halftone is darker, it still clearly lives within the light family and doesn't get confused with the shadows. Speaking of shadows, we have these two values. Just like we had our average light value, I consider these the average shadow values. Now, why are there two of them? Well, that's simply because there's two different base tones. The ball is lighter, the floor is darker. Very much like the two different base tones in our character. And generally speaking, a darker base tone will likewise have a darker shadow. Okay, back to our painting, let's start applying this. But one technical note first. If you hold down Alt, you can sample colors and values. I like the value I have, so I'll pick it. But when I go to paint now, it's way too dark. That's because I've picked a value that's already been multiplied over my background. So when I paint with that, it's like I'm double multiplying it. So to fix it, go to the eyedropper tool here, make sure this subtool is selected. Then down in this box, click on this icon, which will make sure you're only picking colors from your current layer rather than from the entire image. So I'm just blocking in my shadow family now. And the only thing I'm concerned with here at the start is that the two families appear separate. So I'm painting some darks for the shadow and the light is just being represented by that background color. Here I'm just reducing the opacity of the line layer, then click back to the shadow layer and continue working. Notice that like the hair, I'm treating her eyebrows as an overall darker base tone. If you're clumsy like me, sometimes you paint on the wrong layer by accident. So I'm gonna select the line layer and just hit this lock button. That'll prevent me from accidentally putting strokes in the wrong layer. All right, so I'm putting a cast shadow in from her head onto her neck. And again, trying to keep all these shadows around an average value, not jumping around too much. Now for the hair shadows though, those are darker because remember, it's a darker base tone. 
To keep your eyes fresh as you work, it's helpful to flip your canvas. So I go to edit, rotate, flip canvas, and flip horizontal. Then I'll just keep working like this for a while before flipping back. All right, it's time for another little side lesson. There are two types of shadow. The form shadow is caused by the object turning away from the light, and the cast shadow occurs where the object is blocking the light from hitting. I've set up my Asaro head here to have the same type of light that I'm painting. The protruding nose blocks the light from hitting this part of the face. That's a cast shadow. The brow blocks the light from hitting this part of the face. That's also a cast shadow. Now, when shadows collide like this, they join into one shape. You don't see a double shadow. Now, the shadow on this part of the head, that's a form shadow. You know, the planes are facing away from the light and therefore are in shadow. But form shadow or cast shadow, all of the shadows join into a cohesive shape. And these two little shapes here are where the light is actually still hitting. Here's a shot of the head under a harsh front light. But as I move the light to the side and create shadows, look at how they melt together into a series of very similar values. And compare that to the light values, which as I mentioned earlier, can often have more contrast. Remember how the darkest light value right here is called halftone? Well, that's what I'm adding to my painting now. So this side of her face is being struck by light, but the planes and structure of the head are turning them slightly away from the light. Same with the area between the eyebrows I'm painting now, turning away from the light, but not enough to be in shadow. Now, process-wise, I am keeping these halftones on the same shadow layer, which sounds a bit odd because halftones are part of the light, not the shadow. But from a practical standpoint, because halftones involve me darkening things, I find it helpful to keep that on just one layer. It becomes easier to revisit later, as you'll see throughout this video. Throughout the process, it's helpful to turn your line drawing on and off like this. When I'm done with this piece, I don't want the line drawing showing, so turning it off helps you evaluate your progress. Now, while every layer is important to the final picture, I think the shadow layer carries the most importance because it defines the most structure and the most light. So I'm not gonna make any more layers until I feel like this one is working. And when I say working, I don't mean it has to be perfectly finished. Remember, no single layer contains the entire painting. But to me, this is at a level where I can now move on. So I made a new layer and I'm calling it ambient occlusion. This layer will also be set to multiply mode. Ambient occlusion is the darkest value in your painting. It's part of the shadow family, but it only shows up in the deepest pockets of shadow. In fact, I'll turn my main shadow layer off here so you can see what I'm doing. Everything I'm painting here is a deep pocket or crevice of the human head. Also, it's a requirement that these areas already be in shadow. So like right here, where her head is resting against her hair, blocking any chance of ambient light from entering this area, hence the term ambient occlusion. Now, I do have a 20 minute presentation on ambient occlusion alone on my YouTube channel. You should definitely check that out, but here's some Cole's notes. This area here is ambient occlusion. Again, the deepest pocket of shadow. See, this area of the shadow is very open to the air and therefore a lot of bounce light or reflected light or skylight, you know, ambient light, can find its way into that area and lighten it. But not so with this part of the shadow. Ambient light is occluded from this part of the shadow, therefore it becomes the darkest part of the shadow. So here's my ambient occlusion layer, and I'll turn on the shadow layer so they both act together now. I'll switch on and off the ambient occlusion layer and you can see what it's contributing. And I'm actually not fully done here, so I'll tweak this until I'm ready to move on to the next step. All right, I'll make a new layer, set it to color mode, and call it flat colors. And this part always feels like magic, as these colors adopt the values you've spent so much time on. I'm using Clip Studio's airbrush tool for this, and because the layer is set to color mode, it doesn't matter how light or dark the colors I pick are. It's only transferring the hue and saturation. So just play around here. If your values are good, you can do almost anything with color. I want this to be fairly based in reality, but I'm still adding different flesh tones some subtle greens and subtle blues and purples, along with the more traditional reds and ochres. And here I've jumped into the background layer and I'm just experimenting with some kind of colorful background. Now I've selected the shadow layer again and I'm painting white into the shadows, which effectively erases them, to reveal that classic triangular shape of light that we saw in our reference earlier. Then I'm using Clip Studio's blend tool to have it fade away into the form shadow. Okay, from my teaching experience, I know that a lot of people struggle with color. So here's a little tip. 
When you're confronted with an edge, it could be the edge between light and shadow or the edge between two objects, that is a good opportunity to play with color a little bit. Nature is fond of squeezing a bit of a warmer tone in this area. And notice how even this square is looking a little more fleshy as I do this. I think we all know that colors in nature are rarely just flat. And here's what my color layer looks like in Clip Studio Paint. It's completely devoid of form and light, but I have dialed in the color changes to generally occur most where there is an edge between two things. Okay, it's time for a new layer. I'll name this one Lights and set it to Overlay Mode. Now Overlay Mode can go both lighter and darker. It will also affect color. So now for the first time in this painting, I have to think about both color and value at the same time. But it's still much easier than thinking about it all from scratch. In this case, I already have my shadows done, so I'm only going lighter. And the colors I do add have a great chance of working because they're piggybacking on the color layer I already did. Here I'm using that overlay layer to put some color into the edge of the lips, recalling the tip I just mentioned. Doing similar things on the eyelids, the eyebrows. Again, relegating most of these changes to the light family. So I think the obvious additions are these three highlights. Those help make the form pop, but there are far more subtle planes being lit here. You can see this right now as I toggle the layer's visibility. This is me building contrast and more visual information into the light family. I'm separating the half tones, which is the darkest part of the light, from the average light and highlight values. Looking back at the Asaro head, I'm trying to group planes into overall directions. For example, the difference between the jaw series of planes and the cheekbone planes. They're both hit by light, though their orientation is quite different. Understanding the head in planes like this is essential if you want to paint well. Knowing the planes in conjunction with knowing which values go on those planes completely demystifies the process. Now, in this tutorial, I can't get to every single plane, but I do have a seven hour class that does. It covers the head piece by piece, plane by plane, and provides the essential knowledge and tools you need to draw and paint and render the human head. Having an understanding of the human head is essential because the discipline can be applied to so many things. So if you really want to dive into this stuff, I recommend this class. You can find it along with other tutorials at marcobucciartstore.com. All right, so I'm making a new layer, setting it to multiply mode and calling it egg effect. I've got the airbrush selected and I'm adjusting its hardness here. So it's very soft and with a large brush, I'm just putting in an overall gradient. Painters refer to this as the egg effect because if you look at an egg, the values have this kind of cascading effect. So if on a very simplified level, the head is like an egg, this technique can help add a subtle punch to your lighting. So the cool thing about working on layers is at any point you can turn off layers and kind of inspect what your other layers are doing. Here I've turned off the color layer and on a side note, notice it's the values that are doing the heavy lifting here, not the color. Here I'll switch off my lights layer and now I'm really auditing those shadows. And throughout the process, I'll make tweaks where needed. Here, for example, I'm tweaking how the mouth is drawn. And you notice the line drawing has been turned off lately. For the most part, it's already served its purpose. I've transferred all the important drawing stuff over to the shadow layer. But my shadows aren't just a tracing of my line drawing. For example, here's an eye from my Asaro head model. A line drawing of that eye might look like this. Lines, characteristically, are very similar in size and shape. A painting of the eye looks more like this, where shapes can become a little bit more intricate, you know, merging form shadows and cast shadows, for instance. Often the hard line is completely removed to be replaced by softer edges. So both the line drawing and the painting deliver good information, they just do it in two different ways. And while a lot of artists successfully merge the two, it's really helpful to understand the differences in visual language first. And that's why in this tutorial, I will permanently hide my line drawing and just let the painting do everything. I'm not there yet though. Here, for example, I do have the line drawing turned on, which is helping me see the volumes of hair that I'd worked out in that drawing. And just flipping through my layers again, hiding and unhiding different combinations. This helps me see what I might want to work on next. Most of the time I find that it's the shadow layer that needs the most work. As I mentioned before, that layer really drives the painting. On my shadow layer here, I'm gonna pull up a tone curve. This allows me to tweak the dynamic range of the layer, almost like exposure in photography or something. Oftentimes you get kind of used to what you're painting and it becomes difficult to see other possibilities. So I'm just playing around here. All right, let's get back to some basics and talk about edges. 
Notice how this part of the cast shadow is close to the object that's casting it. When that happens, the edge will be on the hard side. Conversely, this part of the same cast shadow is farther away from the object casting it, and the edge gets significantly softer. On our painting here, we can see this happening on the shadow that's cast onto her neck. Here now is the edge of the form shadow. These edges are a little more straightforward. This is a round object, so the edge is softer to describe that. A box, on the other hand, is a harder object, so the edge between light and shadow is harder. Notice, however, that the cast shadow has the same hard to soft behavior. If that box were rounded a little, the edge would likewise become softer. Round that box even more, and the edge becomes even softer. Now, edges don't just happen from light to shadow. You have to consider them on every plane change. Here's the plane delineation between the cheekbone and the jaw, but it's not a hard edge. On her, it's quite a soft edge. And even within that context, the edge is harder near the cheekbone itself and softer as it progresses into the fleshy area of her cheek. All right, so let's make another new layer. I'll set it to screen mode and call it highlights. Screen mode is like the opposite of multiply mode. It only goes lighter. And on this layer, I'll try and find the rest of the highlights. Now, what causes a highlight? Well, if you think of the planes of the head like little mirrors, the highlights occur on the mirrors that reflect the light source directly into your eye. That's all a highlight is, a reflection of the light source. So it's all about the angle of the light relative to the angle of the head relative to your viewpoint. By the way, you can use very similar calculations to determine where the shadows go and where the halftones go. This is why I made that seven hour understanding and painting the head class. So you see that little highlighty line thing there? That's a graphic cheat. There is no small plane that causes a highlight like that. I'm using it to help contrast the form and cast shadow of the nose. Also to help make the edge feel nice and crisp. Because the nose is such a dimensional part of the head, I really feel like this helps the form pop. The lips right here have a similar kind of line highlight, but that highlight actually is caused by a plane that really exists. Here I'm sprucing up the background with some of Clip Studio's textured airbrushes. Then I'll make a new layer on top of the whole stack, call it hair strands, set it to screen mode. I'll first work out some of the larger highlights that are caused by groups of hair strands, and then I'll actually move into individual strands of hair. It's really easy to overdo this. Make sure your hair works first as big clumps of light and shadow before tackling this step. Also, just because I'm on the final steps here doesn't mean I can't go back to my shadow layer and keep tweaking it, which is what I'm doing right now. And speaking of tweaks, I'm going through the layers and tweaking a thousand little things until I feel like the painting is finished. Hmm, a mole could be nice. Maybe she has a mole here or maybe here. I'm gonna make another overlay layer and kind of spill some of the background into the hair simulating almost a soft focus effect in parts of this. Then I'll make one final layer, leaving it on the default normal mode for a change, and just paint out things that are bugging me, kind of brute force my way to a final. And this is where I ended up with this one. Remember to check the pinned comment for all the files you need to follow this tutorial. If you do paint this, share it with me on Instagram. I'd love to see it. Check out more tutorials at marcobucciartstore.com, subscribe to my channel for ongoing content, and I'll see you in the next video.